very famously have dreams about webinar and half work. It's I'm currently about six so far. Um, try and get one a year in at least. Hello and welcome to episode one of the Virtually Anything Goes podcast. My name is Lev Cribb from Webinar Experts and I'm joined by Andy Ashton, our guest speaker today, who is our head of technology here at Webinar Experts. And we're going to be talking a little bit about you. Uh, we're also going to be talking about tips from a successful webinar program manager, which is also you. Really? Uh, yeah, I believe oh, so. Great. That's what I've been told in the brief anyway. Uh, so, <laughs> so we're going to be talking about a whole range of things. Obviously, after all, um, virtually anything goes. So we, yeah. we're going to dig into some stories. There are some stories that we can bring out or maybe shouldn't bring out. So there we'll are some that we can't, but... Fair enough. There's always editing, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Uh, no, we're, we're going to dig into a little bit of your background, just kind of see how you got to this whole area of webinars and, yep. and webinar program management. Uh, we're going to obviously have a look and see what you learned from all of that and what you can share with others as well. So um, when you first joined us, this was back in 2018, so we've known each other for a while, um, you were a very different person yep. professionally yep. as well as... Um, personally, definitely. Personally. I mean, you had long hair. Yeah. Glad what's wrong with that. But you were just very different to how you look today. We might yeah. even stick a photo on, uh, on the screen about this as well. Andy with long hair. Um, so if you're only listening to the audio only version, it's then, a beautiful picture. Don't worry. Then <laughs> check out YouTube for the uh, for the video version as well. You can see the picture there. Uh, so uh, you um, had just left university. Yeah. Uh, you had no passport. No you passport. had never been on a plane before. You had yep. never left the country. Nope. No driver's license. Nope. So you you I don't know. You basically existed with long hair. That was it. That's pretty much it, yeah. Well, that's a bit harsh. You had an audio degree. You had the found, <laughs> yeah, I had a degree. <laughs> you had the, found, the foundations to to join us. But, but yeah. tell us a bit more about that time. Yeah, so that was what, we're talking five and a half years now. Going back, um, I freshly came out of uni. I just finished audio engineering, um, and it was kind of. I think it was. I was basically. I always say it was the right place at the right time. You know, credit where credit's due. You were very gracious to me, um, but there was definitely a lot of things that were showing already. You know, I was. I was all, I've was. i always been very techy. Uh, my audio degree was very much focused on the audio side of things. So I did a specialty in engineering, programming, electronics, and um, just kind of focus on that. And I was process driven from day one. Um, that was very much a big thing. I know when we very, well, one of the very first kind of like months we spoke, you said to me, oh, we'll have like a six month trial, see how you do, see if you fit. I don't know what you thought about that point, but by month two, you were like, no, you're staying. And it was very much like, let's get you more involved in this. So it was a very... It was a good start. I I must have left a good impression. Well, you're clearly still here, so um, yeah. So I, I, would, I would say that's true. Um, but uh, yeah, as we as we kind of went through those first couple of months and probably the first couple of years, um, we were probably a bit of a sight to behold. You with very long, much long hair in your twenties. I with you know a suit on in my my forties. Um, I think at one point somebody actually asked us whether we were together. Yeah, there was a lot of that because obviously very early on we travelled together and it was very much we if you saw us in person we were just you wouldn't see one without the other so it was very it was a dynamic duo let's call it that yeah. not a couple i don't think people could quite place us together but but no they never were, we were always there together yeah. uh where, where, where we had to go uh yeah so and and then obviously at the time i'd i'd, I'd been I'd, I'd created a methodology for uh programmatic webinars yep. and, and web, webinar programs um we were getting you to internalize that as well and obviously we were working with our customers to kind of put that in place. Um, and obviously one of the reasons you joined was we were working with enterprise level businesses and, and you know, who needed that help with the webinar side of things. Yeah. And, and as you were getting into that, obviously you were being exposed to quite a lot of new things. Obviously yeah. you had the audio background, let's say the streaming background, um, and certainly hadn't worked with the, with the larger enterprise businesses before. Not at all. So what, what, what was kind of some of the things that, and if we're thinking about maybe somebody listening who is in the position where they, are running a webinar program or want to run a webinar program, what were some of the th early things you sort of noticed and, and kind of started to learn about that as well? Yeah, so I think it was what you said straight away. There was a defined process and that was always the big thing is that, you know, being able to come into this new, you know, literally completely fresh, you know, no previous junior marketing background, anything like that. I was able to follow an end-to-end -end process and understand it and that massively helped, like more than you'll ever realize it was kind of very much just, I could walk through it step by step and I knew what to do. Of course, over the years, you refine that, you know every single detail, you know kind of what could what could happen, all the variables in that. But at the start, a very clearly defined process was absolutely great for that. You know, it really helped get me involved. And, you know, even when we, when we grew as a company, you know, we could pass that on to people. A lot of people then knew the process and we could follow it end to end. Alongside that as well, it shows just the importance of execution, um, you know, 
it's, it is a dedicated role. Um, when you're juggling multiple webinars, you know, that might be multiple webinars a month. It might even be multiple webinars a week. You need that kind of clear definition because then, you know, maybe you'll have multiple stakeholders involved. You know, in our, on our team, we've got multiple people executing webinars at once. But because we have the process, then we know where everyone's at. We, I can look at someone else's work and go, oh, yeah, that's there. You know, we, it's, it's common in programming and it sounds quite sinister, but, you know, the bus factor is a thing, you know. It's always the famous thing. <laughs> Tell of, us about the bus factor. Yeah, so it's this idea that, you know, knowledge should be retained and should be passed on to the point where, you know, if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, I know that someone else will be able to take over my work, jump in and go, right, I know what's happening. It's not a mystery. It's not completely vague. And, you know, we see this happen quite a lot. You know, you might have one person who knows the process inside and out, but then anyone else in the company doesn't know what's going on. So if, the, if anything was to happen to them, you know, might just be a day of illness, but then webinars completely stop because they don't know the process. Yeah, I, I suppose we, we see that still now very often in, in organizations where there's one person dedicated to it. Uh, in fact, we were just talking to somebody yesterday who says, I'm, I'm doing this solo and in, in country where we have our marketing manager in country in the region. They're doing the solo. There's not a large marketing team around them in the region. Yeah. And they're having to do this individually. And, and I guess that's what you're talking about, right? Yeah. And it is, you know, it's the joys of regional marketing. It's the joys of working on team. You know, everyone has a different process. Everyone has a different way of working and everyone has different timescales. You know, it's a marketing manager in one country might have a completely different agenda to another, but webinars are still the same. The execution is still the same. So having that clearly defined process to walk through is good. Because as I say, you know, you might have one person who has all the time in the world to work on webinars. You might have one person who only has 10 minutes a week to work on a webinar, but having that process that means the output's the same means that whatever comes out of your company, it's going to be of that high standard, hopefully. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. And, and then obviously we um, fast forward a little bit, a few years, and something very big happened in your life. Uh, your hair came off. It, uh, intentionally, I should say. It wasn't like, <laughs> it wasn't mass hair loss due to stress, don't worry. <laughs> But it, it seemed to like release a, a sort of massive energy in, inside of you. you yeah. You know, I, I guess it was coincided with a certain period in time, in, uh, of time in your in your life. But but you you kind of at a similar time that wasn't one of the reasons. But you were promoted to head of technology here. Yeah. Um. And I think you kind of took quite a step forward within the work that you do here, but but in general as well, right? Yeah. So obviously, we'll call it the reverse Samson in that context. You know, it kind of happened, and it was always quite funny because a lot of people said to me when I started this and looking for a job, you know you'll get a real job when you cut your hair. And then obviously <laughs> I had a real job. I worked here. Um, so it kind of, that was almost a protest at that point. I got to a point where I was like, if you're going to say that to me, I'm going to keep it for an extra two months. But it got to a point we were in the middle of COVID, you know, it just, enough was enough. I got it all cut off. It was a great time. And as you say, it was not related to that, I think. Um, but I moved into the head of tech then, you know, it was, in some ways it was a very natural move. In some ways it was a massive step up, you know, naturally, I was always involved in the technology of streaming. You know, I wanted to know every single platform. I wanted to know how all the tech worked. So that side of the role really fit me well. That was the kind of a, we're, put, we're putting a title on this now. Even, that you know, it was every question. It would come to me, every platform question would be around me and it was a good time. But alongside that as well, there was the program management side of it. And this is where it got interesting, I'd say. I think this was the time where I didn't realize how far along I'd come on my journey because as the team was growing at that point and um, I was training up a lot of people and it started to get to the point where I would train them. And as you're going through the process, you know, it's live training. You're showing people what works on an actual program. And I'd say to them, you know, okay, well, we're going to do this and this could possibly happen. And it just started to keep happening that every time I said that it would happen. Um, so it was quite interesting. So I didn't develop superpowers alongside. Well, uh, I was your, branded your the Yuri Geller of webinars for a bit, but um, no, it was very much just an understanding of the process. You know, I'd seen, I'd run through it hundreds and hundreds of times. And, you know, we saw the variations. We had di with different customers, different webinar programs, and you start to see that kind of what can happen. And you know, the joy of what we do, we work with people. Yeah. I knew the people, and you know, that's one of the privileges of the work that we get to work with people over time and really understand their processes as well. It's not just a kind of very much a, you do the work, here's the output, that's it. We want to work with people, and that's the important thing. It's, it's an interesting insight, actually. It's, it's not just about process. I mean, process is important, clearly. Yeah. And, and, you know, you want that to be repeatable and scalable and predictable, uh, but there's always that human element in it. Oh, absolutely. And how much of a learning was that for you in terms of understanding the value of working with the same people? Uh, you know, for example, same speakers or moderators and stuff like that. But can, what, what element of... I suppose your understanding of your role was the human element. So this is the one that I will say I'm still working on as a whole. I think, you know, humans are unpredictable. They always will be. 
Um, and it's something that you do need to constantly work on. And I think it is something that is really important. It really steps your work up to another level. You know, anyone can follow a process, can tick the boxes and get the output. It's the people who can make everyone in that journey feel human, feel listened to, feel valued. That's where it really starts to take it up a notch. And, you know, speakers are the same. You know, we have speakers who we've worked with time and time again. They're really good at what they do. And, you know, we get to build that relationship with them. You know, I'm, I often talk to one of our speakers about craft beer quite a lot just because we've built that relationship over time. Yeah. But the one thing about that as well is that when you are working with different people, um, you've still got to have that element of not cutting any corners whatsoever. You know, it's easy when you know someone to go, oh, yeah, it's fine. We'll make that happen. But, you know, you can't do that. I mean, probably one of the most famous stories. I think you remember this one. It's when the speaker um, during the recording. Do you remember this one? I think so. The one where, oh, go on. Uh, Team me up, but yeah. So it was the um, we were doing a recording, and we worked with a speaker before, and you know, really good speaker, um, very like really was really charismatic, really good at presenting, um, but when was like, yeah, fine, they know how to use the platform. We don't need to go for an alignment call. But then we got to the day. Um, do you remember this one? I do, I do. Uh, you know, it was th this person had presented like say many times before. Great. Um, knew the, knew the platform yeah. and uh, well. Well, well, we, well. We, we had assumed, and, and this is, I think, one of the key points, things that we always say, never assume anything, right? And never change anything on game day. Yeah. But never assume anything uh, applied that day. We, we thought we'd done all the checks and certainly asked the right questions. Uh, but then we got into the webinar recording and the person was talking for yeah, at length. And we thought, gosh, you know, he clearly hasn't got many slides or he'll get through them fairly quickly. But he hadn't advanced the slides. Yeah. It was about 10, 12 minutes in. And uh, he, I don't know what he was clicking on at the time, but, but he either wasn't clicking to advance the slides or he was clicking on something else. Yeah. But um, those slides hadn't advanced. And, and yeah, there, there is that human element. And not ever assuming anything is important to any successful execution because there is still a human element. And we have to understand that that's whether that is because of, uh, uncertainty during a live recording yeah. or whether it's just something that someone's forgotten is, is an important factor in, isn't it? Yeah, and that's important because obviously from my role, and you know, if you work with webinars regularly, you know the platform inside out. You know, I very famously have dreams about webinar platforms. It's, I'm currently at about six so far. Um, try and get one a year in at least. Like, so, but we have that. But then you're looking at maybe a speaker, maybe a stakeholder who only interacts with a webinar once a year and they're more focused on presenting the content than actually using the platform so you've really got to make sure that every single time you've done the training because you know it's all great when you don't do the training it goes right but the day you don't do the training it goes wrong you feel it more than anything and you know we've had you know i'll be honest we've had that before where we've gone yeah they're fine yeah they're fine and you know things have happened you know maybe like speakers not been able to do something maybe it's just not gone the, the way it should have gone and that's where you start to learn and sometimes you know that is a battle with the speakers at times you know just being quite honest there you know some speakers will insist you i don't need the training i don't need the training but then Obviously, the main concern is the output. You know, it's you've got to make sure every single time they know what they're doing and you know, they are very comfortable in that. So then the output is phenomenal. Like you know, yeah. the the speakers who really get it you just completely understand. You know, I've got speakers who will even joke with me during the training. They go, "I know you've done this training before, but we're going to go for it just to make sure." And you know, in twenty twenty three, for the last five ten years, platforms have updated so much that you know, I've had, I've got a rule: if you've not done a webinar with me in six months, you're going through the training whether you like it or not because Platforms are changing, you know. The way we work has changed. I think 20, 2020 was the time, was the year where we really changed our process. Yeah. Do you remember if you remember that that day that event that we did on the laptop that really shouldn't have done it? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's a lot has changed, hasn't it? And, and a lot. through through COVID, you know, a lot of the platforms ad adapted to what the requirements were. Absolutely. And the demand was much higher on those platforms as well because that's what people had to do. Uh, they couldn't meet in person anymore, um, and yeah, it, it's, I think, clearly you've gone through as a program manager before you even got to the point of head of technology role. And obviously you still run and manage webinar programs Absolutely. now as well. But clearly you, you went through a period of time where you managed hundreds of webinars and, and, and the learnings from that, I guess it's, I suppose it's a little bit like, um, this. it's not control freakery, is it? It's not, it's not that you see, so you have to you know, micromanage the speaker. It's not no, about no. that, is it? It's, it's about the ability to predict what will go right and what might go wrong, if anything. And it's a little bit like, you know, I suppose a Formula One driver and then and 
and their engineers. Yeah. The driver ultimately has is responsible for the result, driving the car around at the highest possible speed and and and, and win the podium race. And they will want to get involved. And I think Michael Schumacher was famous for that, wasn't he? That he wanted to get involved with the engineering side and understand the car inside out so that he could, one, contribute, but also make it predictable what the result would be because ultimately he would be held responsible. He's the, the front man. And in a way, a webinar producer, a webinar program manager, has a similar role. It's, it's yeah. just they want to make sure that the speaker has everything they need uh, to succeed and, and, you know, not anything go wrong, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's even taking that one step further. I want to give more than a speaker ever needs. You know, I don't want to give just the survival rate. I want to give you kind of a bit above and beyond because ultimately we're concerned about the output. That's the main thing that, you know, once a speaker sees the output, once they see the results coming in from the webinar, they do not mind anything you've done before that. Like, you know, they're always happy. They can justify anything. If they say, I've done a great webinar, they don't care. Like genuinely, they won't care if you put you in an extra alignment call. When they will care is when the results haven't come in because there's been a lack of training and a lack of process. So having that balance and understanding of saying, you know, it's great that we're going through this and it might be frustrating at the time, but when the output's good, the output's good. And that's what really we're looking for. You know, great audience experiences that are fueled by good training, you know, consistent training, understanding every single detail of that. So the speakers number one, don't have to think about the platform yeah. because they know it like the back of their hand, but equally then the audience experience is smooth because everyone just knows what they're doing. They're in sync and there's nothing in the way of that. Yeah. Yeah. Never assume anything. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Good. So, and, um, so, but during around about that same time, when you went into the role of um, head of technology, you, you invested quite a bit of time and, and effort uh, into your sort of personal development as well. Yeah. And, and that led you down a few different paths. Didn't it? Can you talk a lot about different paths? That? Yeah. So um, one of my things is I, you know, I won't hide it. I want to be the best at what I do. Simple as that. I always want to be the absolute best at that. And the joy of working how we work is that we work with a wide variety of clients. And sometimes you'll get to follow us a complete process. Sometimes you've got to adapt to that. But there's never a time where you get to 100% do what you want to do. That's a reality of life. You never get to do everything you want to do. So I hit a point where I asked the question of, what if there was a space where I could do what I wanted to do? What if I could follow my own process? And, you know, I wasn't going to start my own business officially. Um, and, you know, I wasn't going to, you know, take over, start a mutiny in a company to say, I'm running it now, you do it my way. So I looked in a different way. Now, it'll become as no surprise when I say I'm absolutely nerdy. I am absolutely nerdy. No. Um, yeah, no, really. <laughs> um, so gaming is one of my big passions. And a part of that as well was moving into more streaming for my own pleasure, you know, gaming streaming. So I moved into Twitch streaming as well, okay. um, which I've not found anyone else like does what, who does what I do, where I kind of manage webinar programs through the day and then go home and manage my own webinar program kind of thing. Um, but it's been really, really good for that. You know, it's having that real world experience. You know, whenever I do an alignment call, which I still do, you know, an important thing that we do quite a lot is making sure that no matter where we are in the company, we're still up to date with every single bit of technology, you know, even head of tech, even you. Mm -hmm. Like I know if I ask you to do an alignment call on a particular platform, you could do it. Yeah. You could do it to great level. I think. I'm going to say you can. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that later. Um, no, but so a part of that was making sure that is, you know, I'm living that. And now we're at a point where if I'm, you know, one of my fam famous things is talking about audiovisual best practice. It's something that I'm so die hard about to the point where if you ever, and, you know, big disclaimer for every single one of my clients and everyone who I have a call with, if I'm ever one or two minutes late to your call, it's probably because I'm adjusting my webcam just to make sure it looks as good as it can. But that is the thing, you know, I'm making sure that it is the highest standard. And because of this, because of Twitch streaming, because of content creation, I'm now at a point where I can say all this because I'm doing this nine or 10 hours a week, every single week, week in, week out for the last two and a half years. That's just gone. your personal stuff. That's just the personal stuff. So before however many hours I do here, it's, we've still got a good amount of time just working on my own craft, refining it. And you know, this is how I can do the podcast, by the way, because if you all think I'm a wildly entertaining, charismatic person, I'm not at the best of times, you know, I had to really work on this and refine it. You know, I've done through streaming three times a week, posting TikToks for 500 days straight, nonstop, which is, I don't recommend that to anyone, but still, it was a good way of learning my craft. <laughs> but that, that personal development really did help. And, you know, it's starting to blend in fun ways now where I can start to advise on different things. And, you know, it works two ways. I can then now go to people on the Twitch side and advise stuff on the basis of, I know this works in a business context and you want to approach this as a business. So let's blend this together and let's really see how this outputs. Well, it's interesting because I was thinking about it the other way around. Yeah. I, I thought, you know, because often consumer 
uh, platforms or, or, or technology informs the business side because yes. it tends to move faster. Um, I want to hear your thoughts on that. But before we do that, I'm sure there's quite a few listeners wondering, what are you gaming? Oh, what am I gaming? So at the moment, I have to, uh, there's a long story about this. I am currently, I am playing as of today. Um, if you do watch anything of my things, it might be different when you hear this. I am, I'm currently playing Diablo 4 and Final Fantasy 14, two very, very good games. If you do know what they are, let me know in the comments, send me a message. I'd love to talk to you all about them. Um, but yeah, so I'm playing that at the moment. But as you say, it's that kind of consumer trend start and then business catches up. I know... We went to conferences like you know, just pre-COVID when we could go to conferences. Um, and there was, there was a very proud amongst the platforms. There was a lot of pride about, oh, we're going to give you the Netflix experience of viewing. And it's like, great. Netflix has been out for about five or six years by then. And it was just this kind of like, everyone's like, this is cutting edge. And we're like, no, we've had this for ages now. You know, yeah. YouTube has had that for a while. It's now the webinar platforms are catching up. So we see that quite a lot where what happens in consumer moves along to here. You know, we talk about the, vi- the horizontal versus vertical video format wars where we're kind of we've said for years oh yeah horizontal is the only way to do it we've drilled it into speakers we've done it to everyone when we're recording videos if you're recording on your phone record horizontal yep. now what's happened everyone's <laughs> now right you're going to do it in vertical you know linkedin's great for that everyone loves the vertical video that's how they're consuming so these trends do change quite a lot and by being on that kind of consumer level and creating a lot of level i've been able to pass that on quite a lot you know we're here right now look at this a lot of this has been inspired by creating content on that level. And I've been able to go to Lev and say, we want to make content now and we're going to go about this. You know, we're doing shorts, we're doing the blog posts, we're doing the podcast. All of this has been inspired by what we're seeing at the consumer level yeah. and bringing that into business. I mean, to the point, uh, Dave, who's sat behind the camera, uh, we, when we were setting up this, this podcast and filming corner, uh, we had various conversations about the microphones. And, oh, that was and, a big thing. And, and, you know, should they be in shot or not? And Dave was adamant with this classic videography training that they they should not be visible and yeah. but this is perfectly normal now um and you know obviously you know they they've seized that and, and understands that completely but it was just i think that transition comes from the from the 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 consumer side isn't it the podcast that we okay. see like we're doing now um and and these are things that wouldn't have been you know even in place what four or five six years ago yeah absolutely we would have thought oh why, why, yeah. why, why are those microphones so big? Um, and to the point in some cases you see the lights and, and, and you know, it, it is very different. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily all of that's going to transition into the business side and we'll see webinars with you know, in a horizontal format and stuff like that. But there will be elements, I, su- I suspect, that will feed into that, but somewhat delayed, I guess, right? Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it's part of the toolkit and knowing when to use stuff. You know, there's no hard and fast rule of any content. There's no hard and fast rule of webinars. It's always get what you need to get and make sure it works for the context. You know, what might work for your company won't work for another. And that's always going to be a consideration is what will work, you know. And it might be, you know, demographic-wise, you know, this format might really work for a, like a younger audience, my age of audience, Lev's age of audience as well, don't worry. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, if you're on a more formal level, and you know, you're discussing high level, you're discussing like company updates. This will not be the way to do it. It will be a very different approach you need to take. But understanding both and having both in your toolkit and saying, right, we're going to do this format here, this format there, that's what you need to look at. It's not having the one size fits all approach. Yeah. Well, you say that though. I mean, we, we were talking to a customer the other day who wanted this setup yeah. for a, a quarterly update, or I can't remember. The, yeah, the it's starting update. to become a bit of a thing because I feel like a lot of this is a more personal approach. You know, it's. We're having a conversation right now. And I know if those cameras were switched off, the conversation would look very similar. Yeah. And we'd probably nerd out a lot more, uh, but, you know, we're still kind of getting there. So it's it's becoming more of a thing. And I think it's going to be quite exciting to see how far that goes in that, you know, are we going to get, are we going to just going to be honest with each other and saying, listen, we're tired of the stage videos. We actually just want to hear from a CEO telling us about their real thoughts. You know, the art team's going to hate it, but it's still a thing that we want that more personal approach. It's, you know, I, what I've been seeing for ages and what we're seeing in the industry is that there was so much virtual background focus when actually that's the work, one of the worst things you can do right now. It's, it shows off a closed, it's almost like folding your arms in a presentation. It, it's showing closed body language, but actually by having this more personal approach, you know, whether that be having some of your hobbies in the background, stuff like that, people want to see the people about it and having a more personal approach is really popular right now. Mm, I, I think... It's either in the plan or it's in my head, but we're going to do a, a podcast episode on the, the, the best authentic webinars are always planned ahead. You know, this idea of 
you, you wanted to look authentic. Yeah. Uh, you want it to be, to be real. You want it to be personal. But that doesn't mean it has to be ad hoc. Yes. Uh, you know, you, you do plan for that. And, you know, like any panel discussion, you know, it's, it's typically the, you discuss it before and with your panelists what discussions are going to be so they can have a think about that. And a well-produced panel discussion is typically very well planned ahead as well. And it therefore looks like it's natural. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, you know, for, for, for webinar program managers, it's, it's a similar thing in terms of preparation. Yeah. Um, and talking to their speakers and, and you know, planning and doing a show flow and, and looking at the actual individual webinar content delivery, mm. uh, how that is going to, you know, come across well. Obviously, the, the content itself has to be good, but yeah. how the actual format works and how that comes across. And that, that typically is planned in notes. Yeah. And I think, you know, this is something that, I can say you've done really well in over the past. You know, it's been, you've been a moderator for quite a lot of webinars in the past and it's always been that kind of approaching the speakers and asking them what they're going to talk about. You know, it's, we all have slide decks. We all can present those, but actually presenting them for the context for the webinar and being able to know what's going on with the flow and understanding who's speaking on it really steps it up a notch. You know, the, I mean, you probably put a good word on it. Planned ad hoc is such a big thing. You know, if you see a very well done video that looks ad hoc, it's not ad hoc. It never is. There's a lot of planning it, but it's to the point where you don't see the planning. You don't see it being rigid because the people have got a plan in place, but they're not, but they know it so well that they don't have to go, oh, we're just going to look at the camera right now to see what's next. Director, are we all okay over there? We're not doing any of that. It's, they know what's coming next. They've rehearsed it. So then it just feels natural. And that's where ad hoc really starts coming because it looks so ad hoc. But actually, that's been a well drilled in, refined, PR approved, definitely. Really good presentation. That's that's this kind of it's it's a it's a sort of juxtaposition, isn't it? Between we talked at the right at the start about yeah. process, yeah. how important that is, and structure and methodology and all those things that probably give most people kind of the heebie-jeebies because it, it just it seems very rigid. Yeah. And then, but then we're now talking about how that actually enables us to be more authentic on screen. Yeah, and, and the, that that's really interesting, I think, because it it, it does it doesn't seem intuitive that that's the case but that is ultimately what you're seeing as a result right for those who do yeah something. exactly and you know let's 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 bring music back into this a little bit you know if you've ever learned an instrument you'll you'll know the kind of processes that when you start playing you'll know you'll learn the notes you'll learn you know if i play guitar and bass you learn the chords you learn all of that and it feels very rigid but once you start to really understand those kind of frameworks those systems those structures you then start to be able to improvise on top of that you know mm -hmm. The best musicians in the world, the ones who've got the feel, you know, the one like you look at B.B. King, for example, you know, really good blues musician who had one of the greatest feels on guitar ever. He knew what he was doing. Like he knew everything, every single note he was going to play because he rehearsed and he knew the process inside and out by that point. So I think that's really, that's a good comparison to how yeah, you do webinars right. and presenting. You know, it's, you've got to go through that process to know what to do to then be able to play around with it a little bit. Yeah, uh, that's a great analogy, actually. And we, 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 I just, uh, spoke to one of our, you know, future guest speakers. Yeah, uh, will you know, all to be revealed soon, but uh, he will be talking on that as a speaker. You know, the the kind of top tips as a speaker um, and as a moderator. He's moderated webinars as well, but yeah. spoken on more than, than than moderated. And how he prepares and and his preparation and and kind of the methodology he takes um, and the training he's gone through as well. So that'll be really interesting and kind of ties in what you're saying. Yeah, think. exactly. You know, training is a thing. You know, I do Twitch to train myself on that. While I'm not on. I've never, I've produced thousands of webinars. I've still not actually been on one, uh, which, you know, I'm available for speaking opportunities. Don't worry. Um, but, you know, it is a thing that happens. You know, you've got to train to that point where it all becomes natural again. Yeah. So obviously, you know, the, the, the we've sort of interwoven a few kind of things that you've learned over the, over the, you know, the last sort of, I guess, four, five, six years. Um, and you obviously clearly run a lot of webinars and, and several webinar programs and successfully. Well done. Uh, Thank you. Um, but, Tell me maybe something about a sort of best in class. I suspect there will be listeners who say, okay, well, you know, we want to be best in class. Give us an example of best in class and what yeah. they do and, and you know, what, what tips do they follow and what do they put in place and what does it look like? Can you give me an example of kind of the best in class example? Yeah, of course. And, you know, I hope that you're all listening to this thinking you want to be the very best. You know, it's kind of, it's so ultimately the goal. I don't want you to come to this and go, I just want to be okay at this, really. Like, you know, I'm hoping if you're, if you're coming to this podcast, you are thinking, I want to get good at this. And that's where I'm at, really, with that. But I think 
best in class is one of those things that, you know, I could give you a really good marketing spiel on, you know, do this, 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 but it's not going to work. You know, there's no such thing in my opinion as a best in class webinar program. If it was that objective, we'd have all done it by now. And all the platforms would have worked out a way to monetize that way to get there. Um, but so I think the way you've got to look at it is that you've got to be relentless at pursuing the best of the best. You know, the industry constantly changes. That's always going to be a big thing. And you can't, what will be the best today won't be the best next year. You know, I know for a fact that what, what I think is good today will not be good. Even in six months time, it will be completely different. But being able to know you want to pursue that and you want to be relentless in pursuing that, that's where the best in class is. It's not, it's never going to be the objective tick box, you know, as much as I would love it to be because, you know, I could then tell speakers, do this, 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 and you will get all your leads, all your business, all your pipeline. I would love that. We'd all love that, but it's not going to happen. So having that mindset of actually, we want to constantly strive. We want to constantly look at improving. That's where the best in class is. It's, it's not this idea of, you know, being the 10 out of 10 all the time. It's about growing into the 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10 all the time. Right. So it's, it's, I like that. So the, 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 I suppose the continuous improvement, we yes. talk about that a lot. Oh, um, a lot. Uh, anybody who, who works with us knows that that's a sort of fairly, fairly frequent kind of conversation, top, uh, uh, conversational topic. But the, I guess what, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing you say is each company obviously has its own approach. Yeah. And is different and has different requirements and striving towards those requirements and those goals will, is the kind of key. It, it, but then when you compare them, you can't say one is more best in class than the other because the companies are different. So they have different requirements and different goals and there's, you can't really compare apples with apples. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that goes beyond the company as well. It can go to the platform level as well. You know, every single platform wants to showcase the best webinars on their, on their platform. That won't work on another platform. You know, what will work really well on one won't work well on the other. And it's the same with the company level, you know. You might have a small company who really can do the one-to-one -one engagement really well, but then you fly into your enterprise context, it doesn't work because you can't speak with 100 people on a one-to-one -one level within the space of an hour, but you can in small companies. So it's not as clear cut as this, this, this. And, you know, depending on what, on what your business is, it's going to be different, you know. It's always, depending on your subject matter, you're going to have different best-in-class definitions because you're communicating in different ways, you're presenting different content, and you've got different audiences who want different things. So, the, so there are there are a lot of best practices and they yes. change yes. and some of them will always stay the same. Yes. But as we as we talked about earlier, best you know, best practices four years ago with microphones is very different to what best practices is like now. Um, and technology obviously evolves and we can kind of see differences there. So th th there are a, a bunch of best practices changing and, and, and stable, but best in class is really a definition you have to define for yourself as a company to say, for us to be at our best, this is what we want to achieve. And by the way, we'll work on that on a continuous basis because iteration one of what we want to achieve this year will be iteration two next year and iteration three the following year. And, 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 and that changes over time. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, you've, you hit the point really well there. It's not something that you can achieve within a few months. You know, it's so often people go, oh, I want webinars to work. And then they'll do it in free webinars and go, it's not working. And they go, you've not defined your process yet. You've not really got to understand how it all works. And I think it's something that is pursued over time. You know, the best you know, the best of any role, any skill in life is not something that's done over free attempts. It's done over years and years and years of approach. And that is with comparison to everyone else as well. You know, it's something that I, have, that I see quite a lot is people bring in their own expectations of webinars, you know, and they don't look wider picture. You, know, you might have the experience of your previous company, you might have the expectations of your current company, and you might see one or two competitors, that's it. You know, it's something that I love about my job is that I'm able to look at the whole industry at once. Because I work with multiple clients, you know, I work across different industries, I work at different company levels, and I can see what works. And it's not always to say, you know, this works for all of them. It might be, this works for this one. We can sample that and see how it works. And we can really start to innovate and personalize on that level to make sure that you do get what you want, the best in class. Yeah. As just what you said earlier, in terms of it, it, you can't, it won't work if you just try it over a short period of time. No, not at all. Um, I, I love it's it's one of my favorite sort of memories and stories of when we first started um, with the company and we had our first sort of big break with a very large organization, uh, grown even larger since we started with them. And the the VP of marketing at the time said to me, 
well, said to me and, and the and the campaigns director at the time, we want to we 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 know we want to run webinars. We need them. Um, and my conversation with them was, well, it, it will take a little period of time to implement this. Yeah. And they were very firm on the fact that they were going to give air cover for about twelve to eighteen months to establish this. They said we're, we're not going to, you know, after six months or three months, say this is not working. We're going to, you know, can it off. Yeah. This this is very much a a program that we know needs to run. We know we want to implement. You have the air cover, and you have the endorsement from VP level yes. to the rest of the organization. And I'm still to this day, and this is you know six years ago, eternally grateful for that approach because. That for me was that was for me best in class in terms of how to establish the foundations of a program that will last, that's built to last, that will stay with us for a long period of time because it it just allowed us to not just implement the platform, but actually allowed us to implement the process, uh, iterate the process a couple of times while we were implementing and, and testing and trying out. But ultimately, there's ultimate. Uh, a, a bunch of uh, stakeholders as well who need to get used to that mm. um, and company structures that you might not yet know or that change and and that initial period of time was so valuable and is as ingraining that that those foundations into the company with that air cover from high on uh, high on up that we still now work with this organization yeah. and and the, the webinar program is amazing you know, there's, there's so many great things that come out of that and that all of that was set with that initial mindset of you can't do this with just two or three other hours and, and prove the concept. Yeah. It has to be a longer term approach. Yeah. And I think you know, there's a lot of good things there. And I'm going to kind of bring it a little bit further out of webinars as well. Um, okay. Because I know everyone, some of you will be hearing the word webinar and cringing every single time. Live streaming is the bigger picture of this. Yeah. That's still a very new kind of approach in marketing and communication. You know, it's, we can, you look at email, for example. Email has been around a while. We've got good at it. We've got really, really good at it. Have uh, <laughs> some people have got really, really good at it. Um, but then it, you've got that. You've got in-person meetings, you know. That one we've had a lot longer. Interacting with humans. Yeah. We had that long, long. We're still not good at it, but we're working at it still. But webinars and live stream are still a very new technology. So what you might see is like, you know, we all kind of know the baselines of a good email. We all know the basis of good communication to other humans. That hasn't been fully, I don't think has been fully defined at a level yet where we know what is the, what is a, foundation. I'm not saying best in class. I'm just saying, what is the foundation we expect? Because we see it all the time. What can be considered acceptable in one company is like, no, that's not good enough. Or what we see is, you know, this is acceptable. Some people go to us, step back. That's too much for us right now. We need to take it two steps back. So I think that is a thing you need, you also need to give yourself air cover for. The whole format itself is still defining itself of what we actually expect. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's, I never thought about it that way, actually, that this kind of the, the foundation of what, what a sort of standardization of a live stream and what that yeah. looks like and, and there's, there's so much going on and i suppose it's like early days of the internet as well where you know the, the i don't remember that level i'm too young <laughs> yeah, sure, mate, yeah. <laughs> um uh, yeah anyway uh but the just the industry finding its feet and and trying out different things and there's no regulation I'm not saying well probably streaming should probably have some kind of regulation as well but um just kind of finding a feet of of how does this work what is acceptable what is what is a sort of decent standard? And, and I wonder if maybe it will be one of those that will never have that. I don't know. But I think from a business context, it will be interesting to see kind of where it levels out, where kind of the, you know, the, the, the pendulum stops swinging and says that this is, this is what we accept as a standard. Yeah. Um, for, okay, so we understand, so best in class is very individual to each company. But we can talk about world class. Yes. world-class programs and world-class webinars things that compare well to other webinars in the world and you know within the same context and industry and stuff like that. can you talk us maybe on a, on a high level through the things you've learned and also the things you implement and the things you advise on and you know this is i guess where we're getting into the detail of the actual topic today it took us a little longer to get there but uh the actual you know, learnings and the, the advice you have on a high level for world-class webinar programs are those who aim to be a world-class program yeah, so I think it's, you know, for world-class programs, you've got to start with the design first and foremost. I mean, it's something that you've really got to get right, first of all. Webinars can often be seen as this kind of, you know, oh, we want to do this as an extra. That's not how you make world-class, you know. If you, Are we talking graphic design here or, or program design? 
I mean, good graphics are good. Always have a good designer who can work on things. But no, we are talking about the program design as a whole, defining what you actually want to communicate and achieve and looking at that beyond just the one project. You know, I've seen so many webinar programs start with the, oh, well, we've got this campaign. We want to run a webinar on it. Can you do this? And then they're expecting the world-class design from that. It's not going to work like that. It's, you've got to look at it from a bigger picture and a bigger perspective. And um, program design looks at the whole company. It looks at your whole marketing organization. It looks at everything you're trying to communicate and looks at how you're going to design the webinar program, the live streaming program around that rather than just a campaign by campaign. Campaign by campaign is good. Don't get me wrong. And that's a way to do design, yeah. but it's not the be all and end all. And if you say that is how webinars exist in this one campaign, you're not going to get world-class because there's no, you know, campaign will end six months, one year. It's, you can't get the world-class with just that, as we said previously. So alongside that as well, of course, program design is good. Process design is better. <laughs> and, you know, Lev laughs. He knows I love this topic so, so much. Um, the end-to-end -end process is something that I love and I stand by and will stick by till the end. Just having that end-to-end -end process of knowing if you want to do a webinar, here's where we start, here's where we finish. And you having every single step covered on there. This is important. And we talk about the human element all the time. You do still need the foundation of objective. And it's something that, you know, if you've ever been on a call with me going through the process, I become one of the most dynamic and engaging speakers going. And considering it's the it's probably a very boring topic to a lot of people of, you know, how to brief in a, an email, how to promote a webinar, what, we, what time do we do this? When do I speak to speakers? That is super important. And it's something I'm so passionate about. And it's something that I see takes a program from two marketers trying to do the best to world-class levels straight away. And, you know, it does work because you know, we're, in, we're in the modern world. People aren't having the same job for the next 20 years. People are moving around. So having that process in place that anyone can join in, yeah. you know, your company might grow and you might get more people on your team. You need to make sure you've got a process that anyone can jump in and look at. And it works on so many levels in that way. Yeah. I mean, to a point, we, we, we obviously use Trello ourselves. We use Asana with certain customers and, and you know, various other the project management tools as well. Yeah. And in fact, everybody who joins us here reads a book on process management and kind of the uh, agile and, and, and scrum methodologies and so on, because ultimately that, like you said, puts a process in place that is repeatable. The bus factor comes in, as we talked about yeah. before, uh, but also something that then as the teams evolve, change, grow, uh, that can be easily adopted as well, right? So yeah. I, yeah, I totally get that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things, you know, I feel that fast track my learning quite quickly, you know, we were really like we were very very good at almost drilling that into me, and you know, there were times where I got it wrong, and we, you had to bring me back and go, no, follow the process, don't cut the corners. I know you know what you're doing, you know it's in your head. You need to document this. You need to make sure it's good, and you need to make sure it's clear. And you know, we were very lucky to be in teams at that time. Were even in clients, they got that. We had someone who was very 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 good at this, um, and they just would not. Well, they were very relentless with us. And it worked really well. You know, it was a really good working relationship. We knew everything that we needed to do. We had full visibility on this and we had such a good process down the webinars. They felt natural. It wasn't like a, it didn't feel like a chore. It felt like just a part of an, a flow and a process. Yeah, A safety net, I suppose, in a way. Um, very much yeah. so. You know, we, 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 can't, we don't want to speak about this. You know, when webinars go wrong, you don't want to go to someone and go, oh, it just didn't work. You know, no one wants to hear that. No one wants to hear it didn't work. You almost want to hear the kind of things that have happened to prevent that, things that could have caused it, and things the way, the way you're going to solve it as well. And a process helps that because you can, if anything was to ever not happen, you can look back and go, was this process followed through? Was this executed? What didn't work? And then you can, you can implement from there, you can increment from there, and, and you can go, right, what do we do in the future to make sure that doesn't happen again or we can prevent that happening? And that's really important. That is, pro, that is why process design is so, so good. I agree, and and I love process, and and I suspect there'll be people listening who also love process. Now, I, I hope su so. Suspect there'll be people listening who say, "Bore off this, uh, you know, process is, uh, you know, no way." Yeah. Um. You know, either have to don't, don't have time for it, don't have the inclination for it, uh. And I, I, <laughs> there's part of me that understands that approach as well in that perspective, uh. But I've seen the process and how it's saved our bacon, saved our customers' bacon and has allowed us to react really, really quickly to things that either weren't included in the process or were missed in the process or 
were assumed, like we talked about before, assumed to be done. Yes. And where we could identify very quickly, retrospectively, what hadn't gone to plan and, and, and adjust that. But also proactively looking ahead saying, okay, we now want to shift our production value, our output quality to something different. And yeah. so what, because we knew the process was being followed consistently, we yeah. knew where we had to make the tweaks uh, and changes to implement something new. And we would know as a result, because the process is so consistent, that the small tweaks we were making one at a time had a particular effect and impact. We wouldn't have known that without having a consistent process because, you know, if the process is all over the place, it's harder to kind of measure then results and changes. So, so that's, that's really important, I think, as we look at, as we talked about before, this continuous improvement. If you, if, you make, if you have a consistent process, you make a small tweak and you see what is different next time around, yeah. you know what impact was, what, what, what impact that, that change had. Uh, so, I, yeah, I totally get it and, and, you know, I do like to geek out on that as well. And I hope this explanation for those who say bore off with process gives you a little bit more insight into kind of why we think that uh, might be worth looking at. Yeah, and we'll come back to that later. I think, you know, we, I'll give you a little bit of a secret here. You know, we talk about the idea that, you know, the best presentations are planned a little bit. You have a little bit of a kind of plan where we're going here, but we'll get back to that anyways. But I think one thing about that as well that is super important is the implementation itself because, you know, writing down your 10 commandments of how to run a webinar is great. No one's following them. It's pointless then, isn't it? You know, it's, we see it all the time. You know, marketers, and this is no, no discredit to anyone, is that, you know, you find your ways to do things and you find your shortcuts, you find your workarounds and you start working towards that. And that's where, if you're working in a big team, for example, the process starts to fall apart very quickly. And it's, that's what I think is really important in your first year, two years, is that you've got people in place who are, fault, who are checking that process. You know, it's often where people fall apart quickly. You know, we spoke about people who find it boring. A lot of people don't actually find a detailed process boring because it shows you, like, you know, it gives you the A to Z of what you need to do. It's actually doing it that's the boring part because you're just like, oh, I need to go through this. I need to go through the motions again and again and again. But that's where you can guarantee or at least you can reduce any risk possible. And implementation is important. You know, it's not, it's something you need to work with people on. It's people will do things their own way. And we need to, and we need to make sure of that. You know, it's, it's the part of the job where sometimes I feel like I'm kind of whipping people a little bit. But again, once the webinars come out, once the output's there, and once you know you've got everything off the back of it, you see the value in it very, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and I think I think you know maybe it's just my my nature, but I'd rather have a consistent process that's predictable than a inconsistent process where I'm constantly on the edge of my seat thinking yes. what what could possibly go wrong. And, you know, that's because obviously we, we serve our customers, but even if I was a customer, I'd want that as well. And, and I think the benefit of the predictability outweighs the uncertainty. So, okay, so we've got, we've got program design. We've yes. Got, um, uh, we've got process design. Uh, process design. So we've designed them. Yep. And we're implementing them. Implementing now. Yeah. Okay. No, we've just done implementation. Have, see, yeah. Our description's great. Don't we? <laughs> um, no, we look, but we've got to look at program planning as well. Yeah. Um, which I love that one. Lev loves that one. And to the point where I just don't even do it. I'm just like, Lev, just, you can have your day with this one. But it's honestly, if, it was, if, I, if, you would, if I was to go to any company and look at their webinar program, if I was going to give a health check, I'd look at that first. I'd look at what your plan is because that's where you really start to see the process in action. You start to see all of the process. You see the program design. You see the process planning. You see the implementation. You see all of that very, very quickly. And if there was one thing that would make or break anything, it's the planning, you know, having a six to 12 month plan of what you're going to do. It doesn't have to be, I know every single word that's going to be said on this webinar. It can just be, I know the topic. I know what we want to speak about, which, you know, as part of your program design, you'll know what you can speak about. But then actually just having that in place means that you can run everything. It flows much better because once you've got that planning in place, you then can work the process around it. You then know, right. I need to, you know, six to eight weeks ahead of time, I need to start the process and I need to implement to this level. So having that plan in place is so important, but I know you're literally looking at me as be like, tell me now, talk to me about it. So Lev, tell me about why you like planning. <laughs> it, 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 I think, as you said, I think it just visualizes the process. Plan shows, shows you that, you know, if there's a process that works, the plan will work as well and will be in place. 
So I think I think that's a really important part of it. The I, I won't. We've 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 got so much only so much time left on this podcast. Yeah. There is a whole guide that we wrote on this, and it goes into you know significant detail on how to approach planning for webinars on an annual basis without really knowing a huge amount to begin with. Yeah. So check out webinarexperts.com um, in the blog section, the resources section. There is there is a, a, a guide to that. So I'd love to talk more about it, but let's let's move on. Yeah, to that. and yeah, if you are on YouTube, you're watching this. The link will be in the description. Yeah, so how about that? But so that as well. What's next? We, we, well, we need to execute, right? We need oh to, yeah, we uh, need to make things happen. You know, we can't do, to do it. Like, <laughs> so, but that is a big thing, and you know, this is something where I've got to give credit where credit's due. Um, over my time, I've moved from execution to management, and my job would be nothing without execution specialists. You know, I've got people around me who execute day in, day out. And this is where, you know, to blow our own trumpet a little bit, this is where we really stand out is that we execute webinars day in, day out. And there's no, that's not even exaggerating. We will be looking at four to five webinars every single day of our working lives. And that's something that's quite unique. You know, you might in your company look at one webinar a month. And that is where people can say, yeah, you know, webinars. Imagine if you did that every single day with five webinars across multiple industries. That is where it really starts to set apart. And that's where knowing execution is important because you need to do it. It's as simple as that is that there are so many people who promise good plans. You know, I'm sure we've got stories about that where people have come to us and said, great plans, but actually doing it, you know, it sounds obvious, but you need to be able to do it. Simple as that. Yeah, uh, I, I suppose with that volume, if, if you know, using that volume example, it, it then, it does compound, you know, yes. small things that you don't do or small things that aren't, ideal or perfect, they do compound at that volume. And it's the same for a company that might not do one webinar a month, but, you know, 50 webinars a month because they're, they're, they're huge global yes. enterprises. Those small executional kind of small fails, you know, even just omittances, um, they will add up and, and you know, it, more audiences will be exposed to that. So that they'll have a bigger impact. on it. Yeah, and I think, you know, I don't want this to be doom and gloom. It's not always kind of a look at what you've missed out. You've done a bad job. It's more look at the potential you're missing yeah. out on. It's, you know, innovation you, potential. Exactly. It's, you know, if you miss out, say you're on a webinar, as your, your moderator doesn't have a CTA to say, ask some questions now. Speakers might not, like, you know, your audience might not do it. That one question could start a conversation that could lead to sales. Imagine if you did that across, as we say, hundreds of webinars a year. You're missing out on hundreds of opportunities at that point. So even these micro details, these little adjustments you can make to this, if you get those right and you execute to that level, you'll start to see the benefit of them straight away. Yeah. yeah. Kaizen is the word, isn't it? Small incremental changes. Also for the name of my MMA gym for the exact reason. Uh -huh. MMA as well. There's a man of many talents. Yeah, I'll invoice them later for the, pro for the plug. <laughs> <laughs> Gaming, MMA. Exactly. Streaming. I've got everything. You know, this is what happens if you don't meet my deadlines. I can't I can beat you up. Um, but anyways. <laughs> Good. So, so we're executing uh, and obviously we need to do more out of the back of that. We will have loads of insight from yeah. that engagement with the audience. Um, so, so where do we kind of on a high level end up? Data, 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 and innovation. It's 2023. We're modern marketing now. We don't just do anything on the hunch. We do it on data now. And, you know, understanding that data really does influence our decisions in terms of innovation and how we steer our programs. And that's where, again, it comes back to what you've done before. Because you've designed your, pro your, your whole program from the top up, from the top down even, um, you've then got this all these data points to capture. Because you've put the process in, you then can have these data points to see what works, what doesn't work. Because you've planned it all in, you then know when you're going to be able to capture this data. Because you've executed, you're able to get that data. It all comes back to this idea that more data means you can influence your decisions and actually have better webinar programs. And the data sometimes isn't nice, you know. You can't argue with data. People might say to you, that was a great webinar. You know, they, I'm sure that it was a great webinar, but... You've got to look at the data and see what's working, what's not working. And that's where it really is difficult. You know, it's not easy to look at the data and go, we need to change things or we need to improve it. But that's where it really takes it to another level. And that's where innovation starts to come in. You can look at the trends and go, this has happened. So we're going to start doing this. And innovation is something that, you know, you need to continuously be doing. But that's only off the back of data. You know, you can't do that off opinion. Everyone has their own opinion. And not every opinion is right in this world. So over having data to say, we're going to do it based on this, yeah. that's where we do it from. Yeah, no, and if you, if you listen or watch the, our sort of launch, launch podcast for 
uh, this podcast, uh, episode zero, as we called it, um, that was, first of all, where I confessed a big, made a big confession. So if you haven't Very watched big. it. Very uh, big. And a serious one. So do, do, do watch it. But it is where we talk about, or where I talk about the, the insights we get, the, the, the data, yeah. and, and how that really drives benefit of webinars. It's not the webinars of, as, a, as a tool. Of course, that's, that's great, but actually the, the insight we get from that, and that's so important. And that's what we do it for, because we can do so much more with that, right? Yep, definitely. All right, brilliant. So let, let's now quickly get into kind of the, the real nuts and bolts, kind of the, the things you would sort of take away, um, you know, things that people have been maybe listening and waiting for on this podcast as well. You know, what, what are the, with all your background, all the experience, all the webinars you've run, all the programs you've run or are running, what are the things that you can sort of, list out for folks to take away to say this is what i should focus on i feel like you're letting me loose here at this point but uh, fly free yeah the editors are gonna have fun with this later no i'm joking (laughs) Uh, no so i think to start with it's championing webinars so you've got to have someone who believes in webinars you know it's it often happens that webinars are seen as a side project for one marketer it's not going to work like that if you have someone who doesn't believe in webinars in the first place they're never going to grow you know it's if you have your own side hustle and you don't really believe it's going to grow, it's never going to fully um, build into this business that you want. So you've got to have someone who is, believes in the webinars and is willing to make it work. You know, that is something you need to look at in your own company and go, is there someone who actually believes them? Not just does them, because doing them is one thing, believing them is another thing. You know, just doing them and taking the box to get the wage at the end of the month, that's not what you want. You want someone who is passionate, who will drive webinars, and will sometimes have those difficult conversations. So you, so you need at least two people. One, somebody at a high level who champions them. Yes. And somebody at the execution level who champions them. So you need at least two people. Who... I would say two. Um, I think, you know, you can, st- I think the high level one is probably the more important one because obviously decision makers are great. We like those. And if, you know, you can often trickle down from there. The other way around it is difficult, but you still can do it. I've seen it before where, you know, someone's been really passionate in a company and have driven many initiatives before. But having that dual layer, having someone at the high levels who say, we want to do webinars and we want to do them well. And keynote there being, we want to do them well, but truly meaning that when they say it, you know, everyone, if you say you want to do something in business, you want to do it well. It needs to generate something, but actually truly saying we need to do this well and holding people accountable to that. Not just saying, oh, have you done 12 webinars this year? Great. They've been done well. No, it's you've done 12 webinars this year. Right. What's the plan for next year? How are they? What data have you got from them? And where are we going to innovate them? That's where it gets really, really good. Alongside that as well, um, platform. Um, this is the big one. And obviously, we're platform agnostic. We don't say this platform is the best. I don't believe one platform is the best for everyone. Again, same as always, you've got to look at what you want. But understanding your platform and, and being confident in that. One of the big hesitations, and you know, sometimes it's the hard part of the job, is people come to me and go directly to my face and go, I don't like webinars. It's like, great, what am I going to do about that? Um, but it's often that's not the, quite the point they're trying to make is they've often had a bad experience on another platform. Right. You know, as we say, business, we move around all the time and we all have different definitions of webinars. We all have different platform usages. And some people might have had a bad experience because they've got a platform that isn't really built for what they want to do. Um, so having that, knowing what you have and doing it well, and that might mean you might have to change some opinions. You know, that happens quite a lot where people are you so comfortable with one platform and they want to try and jam that experience into every other platform. You've got to be willing to commit to that and show the benefits of a new platform or a different platform, but equally be willing to kind of make it work. And that sometimes means you've got to change how you present and how everyone presents to fit that platform. And that's okay because again, good content is the focus. People will not like that initial growing period of changing how they present, but they will love when they see the results come out of it. And that links perfectly into formats. Now, I'm not going to say anything on this one. Because I know this is my opinion, but I feel like Lev is screaming inside. The, the arms are up for your audio listeners. Yeah. Lev, why should we focus on formats? <laughs> well, Andy, <laughs> formats are probably the most underestimated, undervalued aspect of a webinar, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, there are audiences who are at different stages in their buying journey, and they have different content requirements, and different webinar formats will give audiences the kind of format gives them the content that they need at that moment in time. Do you have a diagram to represent that? Well, <laughs> we this is an internal talk. joke. We should be clear on this yeah, one. Yeah, no, we've been talking about this for years. So uh, if you imagine a sales funnel, the classic sales funnel. Oh, but it's not a sales funnel. It's though, not is a it? sales funnel, okay. it, but it's the shape of a sales funnel. Oh, okay. And it has the layers of a sales funnel. Okay. But it's but not it's, a sales but funnel. it's not a sales funnel. 
And within that, you have the awareness stage, consideration stage, all that. Kind of stuff. And as you go through that, you can actually match webinar formats to the different layers. Yes. Now, we look at it from a perspective of the maturity of the audience in terms of their level of knowledge about the company and the product. So at the very top, low level maturity of what I know about a particular company or its product, I want to find out more, um, potentially even just the industry. And as I go through it, I become more and more clued up about what the company does, what the product can do. And as I go through that, there's different webinar formats that are then um, matching with what I need at that moment in time. So yep. If I'm very well advanced, I'm very mature about my knowledge of the company and the product, I will want to dig really deep into the te technical detail. So I do not want a first call deck. I do not want a general kind of this is what the industry does and here are all the, the fancy numbers. Those numbers were great two months ago when I needed yep. that information. Right now, I'm really not, I really don't care about it. So that, at that moment in time, it's a really, really technical format. And adjusting your plan and your schedule for webinars throughout the year to match those different formats up with the audiences that need it uh, is, in my opinion, the single most effective way of engaging an audience and actually generating a um, pipeline that is really meaningful and really, really strong. So that's webinars for you. That's the power. And in fact, there's, a, there's even an article on the website. Oh, so, uh, we're giving you more and more. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> take a look at that. The power of webinar formats. Uh, we feel very passionate. But I think as well, it's more than just a audience exercise. You know, obviously, our end goal is the best audience experience. But speakers love this more than anything. You know, I've, I speak about how people don't like webinars. It's not that they don't like webinars. It's they don't like doing the same thing over and over again. You know, we see so, many people see webinars as sitting in front of a webcam, presenting the same slide deck that they presented in the, in the boardroom two weeks ago to, to more people that they can't even see. They see that as webinars. And that's what they don't like. And, you know, by presenting different ways to communicate, you know, some that will be tailored to certain speakers, you know, we all have different learning styles, communication styles. If your webinars match that, you start to see a better audience response, but you'll start to see speakers doing some amazing things with them. I think, you know, we've probably got the one famous story about the different formats with one speaker who... I think it's safe to say they didn't like webinars and they were very vocal about it to start yep. with this one. I think, do you want to go with this one? Yeah, I mean, they were. Uh, they, they were very clear. That I think they'd been sort of voluntold, you know, you, you should very much this webinar by their boss. Uh, it was very clear they were very, very busy and, and didn't like particularly the idea of presenting on a webinar. Had, as you said, bad experiences with webinars before. And this particular format was, was an Ask the Expert webinar format. So really no slides prepared, all about the audience questions going into detail there. And we brought them on. We, we had a, I suppose, reasonably similar setup to what we have here, actually. And they were just going through all these questions that had been pre-submitted. Uh, and I think there was about 100, 150 of them. So, yeah. you know, very, very engaging. And after, I don't remember the exact words they used, but after the webinar, they effectively said, right, when's the next one? I was say, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think there were words. It was just kind of like, I think I literally pressed stop and it was just like, when's the next one? There was a, it was almost that assumption that there will be another one because this was so good. Yeah. Exactly. And, and yeah, so it's, it's good. It's, good. it's, it's, it's great. It's, and, and that, that kind of effect will also translate over to the audience, right? Yeah, absolutely. They you, will have had the same experience and thought, yeah, this was amazing. When is the next one? You know, and that's when you have them. That's when you've got to catch them. Yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, it comes back to the simple thing of if you're passionate, if you're excited about presenting, you'll present good content. If I just sat here right now and just, you know, toned down a bit, got very bored, Video listeners, you'll be seeing this where I'm just looking down at the table. This isn't, this is terrible content, you know, and it happens, you know, you'll see people staring into a webcam that isn't positioned right. They'll be looking at a slide deck and reading from the deck and then expecting world changing results. It doesn't happen. It's when you get, you can capture the energy of your speakers, of your audience. That's when you really start to see that. And formats just really help with that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So let's, 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 I think, round this up. We do, we do have, um, I think a point that you want to make in terms of yeah the the the, the point of all points right? yes I think the point of all points is I'll say I'll call it fundamentals and we'll give a bit of a story now I can't believe we've managed to do this that we teed it up so well we're talking about kaizen and MMA so if you don't know I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu I'm not good at it but I do it um Better and than I am I mean we'll test that later <laughs> video coming soon uh, but no one of the greatest athletes of all time in Jiu-Jitsu is Hodger Gracie, well-known, big lineage. The Gracie family founded Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So 
has good lineage. It might be comparable to what you're like, you know, you might have come from five great companies, you know, and you know what you're doing. But what was really important about how Hodge Gracie became one of the greatest athletes of all time, multiple world champion, has transferred to MMA, done really well, all of these good things. He focused on the fundamentals. He was never known for a fancy, slick move that, you know, will look great on Instagram, but will never be able to done by anyone else. He focused on the fundamentals and he got them to the absolute highest level to the point where people said to him, we know what's coming. Like they all knew what's coming, but there was no way they could escape it. And I think that's very true to webinars as well. The fundamentals are what are more important. It's so easy. You know, I see this all the time. People say to me, you know, they want the good webinar and they'll go, right, we've got our key event of the year. We've got six figure budgets down. We want to make this webinar great. That is easy to do. You know, I can bring in an AV team. I can put hours and hours and hours into prep, into practice, whatever. You'll get a good webinar at that. If you didn't, after a six-figure budget, I'd have questions. What really makes a program good? What makes any webinar, live streaming offering good is good fundamentals. It's almost kind of, you know, find the least sexy subject in your business. Make that good. Everything else will flow from there. I think that is where you can get those fundamentals right by designing a program, by designing a process, by executing at that level that's where you start to see the real success. Because ultimately, you know, the audience don't see everyone's output. They see the company's output. So the good webinar will come from your company. The bad webinar will come from your company. It won't come from the, oh, well, we understand it was done by this marketing manager who had a lot going on this week. And the speaker was just a, had a bit of a flu the week before. They don't see that. They just see bad output. But by getting those fundamentals right, by making sure the first webinar is as good as the last, the lowest of the low webinar, the one that no one wants to do is fantastic. Then everything flows from there. And the, ex the audience expect good things from that. And that's where you start to get really good webinars. Brilliant. It's great to hear you talk about this because obviously, yeah, we've worked together for, for years and we do talk about it pretty much every day. But, yep. but uh, you have to stop me quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, we, I really hope this was helpful for you listening. Uh, great first episode. If you didn't watch episode zero. I just mentioned it before. Do check it out. It will be in the links below or wherever you get your podcast from. We'd love to have you there. We'd also love to have you in the next Virtually Anything Goes podcast. Uh, so take a look out for that. And if it's not out yet, just keep checking back. But uh, we will be um, providing... Can I, can I do the millennial thing that you haven't done yet? Go on. Make sure you like, subscribe, give us five stars on every single platform you can. Just make sure you stay updated. Come on. Uh, and that's why we're so different. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> please do that. All of that. Uh, but no, please join us again. And we love talking about this. I hope you really enjoyed it just as much as we love talking about it as well. So thank you for joining us and see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. See you.